Okay, Riley, you just mentioned that uh, you feel when you get a paper back when you were an English major, when you would uh, probably pour out your heart in, in some sort of a, a written work that when somebody criticized it, um, that that was kind of tough for you or it wasn't something that you uh, enjoyed. So much so that you changed the direction <laughs> of where you were headed in, in school. So that's a great segue for us to talk about where the Enneagram One goes in what we call stress, when they're less resourceful. And I always think of it like, um, so what would happen is, is that for Riley, she would exhaust herself of all of her oneness, okay? She's used all of the features of the one. And the personality that we create um, when we're little kids actually is a safeguard or a defense mechanism that um, before we kind of hit the bottom, because when we hit the bottom, we all look the same and we're all pathological. We're all unwell, unhealthy, and every single number can actually have suicidal tendencies. But what happens is, is that there's a defense mechanism built into the personality structure that once she's kind of exhausted herself of being a one, there's an escape hatch that her personality will press. And rather than falling into the basement of one, which can and does happen, it's like she gets shot down the slippery slide and she'll go to the number four. Four, what? You go into the heart triad. Mm -hmm. um, what does that look like? Well, I should mention, I felt like I should mention that um, when I go to four or I go to my um, other number, I don't know if you want me to mention that now, but um, I sometimes don't know it's happening until after. Mm. Um, I feel out of control. And I feel like I can't identify it. And I sort of lose my sense of self because I lose my inner critic a little bit. Um, so when I am doing worse or I'm doing better, um, I don't notice until after. And I've returned to my one and my inner critic is like doing a little like inventory of how's Riley doing. And um, yeah, I sort of feel like I lose a little bit of who I am um, as a one. And uh, so I go to four. Uh, can you repeat what you wanted me to talk well, about What there? happens when you go there? And it's so funny, I just got the image of the movie Inside Out, where the child in that movie's name is actually Riley, I think. Oh, watching that movie with my mom was terrible. Oh, my gosh. And <laughs> Joy is the one that's trying to keep everything going, right? She's yeah. the one that's like, what's happening to Riley? <laughs> so what happens to you, Riley, when you've exhausted um, kind of all of the basic traits of one, and then you press that escape hatch, you slide down to four, so you said um, you said it really well. You kind of lose sense of yourself, mm -hmm. like an out of body thing. Not like out of body, like astral projection, as much as it's just kind of like I, I feel like I can't come back to like control center, and mm. I, I'm not double checking my actions, and I'm not, I'm not as aware of um, how this is going to affect me in the future, and. What uh, if what I'm gonna say is gonna hurt somebody? So my inner critic like totally like loses her mind. Um, and as a four, I feel like I either have like prima donna, prima donna like drama queen nightmare or like total weepy mess. Um, so I can be dramatic and snarky and sarcastic and like almost toxic to be around. Mm -hmm. And I can also be like I can cry and I think the world is ending and. Um, funny you should mention when I changed my major, I had a couple of days where I was just in four and I was like, the world is ending. Um, I'm changing my, my major and I've wasted my dad's money and I wasted all this time and this is the worst decision ever. And how could I be unhappy? I had such a good plan. And a couple of days later I came back to one and I'm like, I can plan my way through this. Like I was totally ashamed of myself and I felt like I was, I was dramatic and, I didn't give myself time to think, think things through. Um, my inner critic just lost it. And um, I don't like going to, to my four because I feel like I'm mm. not in control of myself control. and I am somebody else's problem, I feel like as well. And just to recap some of the, um, the high and the low qualities of four. So fours are the creative ones they're the most intuitive number on the Enneagram mm -hmm. for themselves and for on behalf of others um, they're very in touch with feelings yeah um, they're very in touch with emotions and just the sense like the, the quality of just sensing um, lighting mood texture tone taste 
um, you, you love to cook and bake. Mm -hmm. You're wonderful in the kitchen and you have been, I was joking before we went on mics that I said, I can remember Riley baking things, you know, when she was as high as the cupboard, like you've always been very in touch with, um, just the sensory side of life, you know, and, and the, the richer side of life. Mm -hmm. And so even though going there, uh, you can just hear how she um, was describing how she doesn't like it. However, I have seen the high side of four in Riley a lot. And I think that's why we can connect because we actually share two numbers, mm -hmm. right? We, we share a line to one and four, both of us. Um, so I've always appreciated in her how she is... Um, I would say you're okay with the B side of life. You know, if you have the A side where everybody kind of goes that way and then there's the B side where it's like your own traveled path, mm -hmm. I would say you're somebody that kind of walks your own walk. And I've always noticed that in you and appreciate that. But for, for Riley to get to her number, which is her security point, so where she goes, when her environment feels safe, when she's with people that see and understand her, you go to which number? Uh, I go to seven. Seven. Again, Enneagram's hilarious to me. <laughs> so she goes from this very controlled person looking for everybody to kind of know that, you know, she's got it all together, which when she's feeling well and resourceful, that's how she shows up. When things get slippery, she slides to emotional four. And then when she feels safe and insecure, she goes to the enthusiast. She goes to seven. What's your experience with that? Uh, again, I sort of don't know that I went there until I'm not there anymore, uh, and I can reflect on it mm -hmm. after. Um, so it's um, the rigidity that comes with uh, sort of my values. Um, it's almost as if I feel it being lifted mm -hmm. off my shoulders, and I can be free and fluid. Um, my inner critic shuts up because... Mm -hmm when I'm safe and I'm with people that I know like love Riley for who she is and they trust her, um, I don't have to second guess what I'm going to say or do next. And just being completely natural is okay. Um, and uh, when I'm with my best friend, I know that it, I don't have to double check what mm -hmm. I'm going to say because she knows me so well. So that filter that you often use mm -hmm. with, you know, did I turn the right way? And did I, did I hurt someone's feeling? Did I make the tea right? that kind of goes in, it's more subdued in the background. Mm -hmm. And some of the words that we said earlier on were um, um, th the animal within, mm -hmm. right? That, that gut instinct triad that you live in gets repressed kind of on the daily with the one energy. But when she moves to seven, um, the natural rhythm, rhythm of spontaneity, instinctive expression, and play. Playfulness, I was waiting for you to mm -hmm. say that because I feel like, I also feel like I've missed out. Like, oh, I have to play so hard now. Like, I have to have like as the child? most fun. Just whenever I I feel like I am in seven, yeah. I go so much harder. Like, mm. I, I stay up too late, and I sometimes miss important things that one Riley wouldn't have missed. Mm. But um, I just, I am having so much fun, and I'm playing, and I'm allowed to be spontaneous, and I sort of, like, overindulge that feeling and then I lose control and my one self pays for it later <laughs> <laughs> cleans up after yep. the party it's like okay exactly <laughs> exactly and she's like okay <laughs> that was fun but this you can't is, live here all the time yeah it reminds me of why I need to be one all the time yeah. or my life is gonna I'm gonna lose it yeah yeah um the way that the Enneagram works is that for for us to access our security points so for Riley the seven what we need to do is we need to rise in our number of where we go in stress and we need to rise in the overall health of that number and sort of pack a little suitcase of the, for her, it would be the high qualities of four. So compassion, um, um, allowing yourself to be a little self-absorbed in a good way. You know, I'm going to take, in, instead of taking care of like all the matters that are going to be correct and, and proper and, and in order, allowing yourself to, oh, what do I need right now? You know, what's, what's best for me and, and my physical body and, and, and just my emotional being right now? Pack a little bag of the high qualities of four that help sort of augment or, or rise up that uh, support that seven energy. Do you ever feel that going on for you where you can kind of walk that line all the way across from, it, it's like one is the, um, over the water, right? And you have to build a bridge from four to get to seven. Mm -hmm. Do you ever sort of feel that happening for yourself? I, yes, I kind of know what you mean. Um, when I, I went through a pretty serious breakup, 
Mm. Um, and after I sort of like, you know, got over the tears and the heartbreak and the ice cream, I, <laughs> I had a hard look at myself and was like, what don't I like right now? Mm. Where am I unhealthy? And I was really unhealthy um, because I hadn't been taking care of myself. Mm. I'd been putting more energy into r- this relationship that was dying. And um, I, I had a hard look at myself and I was like, I, I need more compassion. I haven't been taking care of myself at all. Mm. And I s- sort of set some goals on how to just be a better Riley uh, because I didn't like who she was. Mm. And a couple of weeks after a breakup, I kind of was feeling the best I'd ever felt. It was like the right end of my third, or sorry, my first year. And then I went home and I had the best summer because I just tried my best to take some, some compassion and to really spend some time with myself versus what other people wanted and I felt my probably my best after I got out of a breakup because I was able to look at myself more critically and have some compassion for myself Mm -hmm. and take what I learned there and give it to other people and I just wanted to be nice to people um because I hadn't been being kind to other people I'd been focusing on me and a couple of other people and And that's that's the high quality of four I, yeah, and I, I didn't yeah. like not doing that. So yeah. I, l- I took that and I did my best to, again, just use my inner, inner critic to double check, did I use this compassion correctly? Did mm-hmm. I do that okay? Let's turn that up a little bit. That's amazing. I love that you had the insight to observe all of that because that's not easy work, right? It, it takes um, detaching from the behavior to witness what you've done and then... Um, the self-development piece is where you actually take action, which mm. sounds like you did. I want to tell a quick little story about the two of us and how um, we kind of can relate in, in a similar way. So recently, during all this COVID-19, I went to a social distancing party in Riley's parents' driveway. Of course, Riley was home from university, and um, we probably broke a few rules in the no. amount of people. No, I didn't. I br- did not break any rules, Jody. No, you didn't. <laughs> But I think we had too many people over to your mom and dad's house because there was a basketball game going in the street. (laughs) There were several lawn chairs going around a fire pit. And then there was, you know, people standing around the yard. And Riley and I began talking and she said, oh, I want to ask you a question about the Enneagram course. We're we're gone. Right. We're just chatting, chatting, chatting. And we got the reflection that day that, um, you know, we we were only talking to each other. (laughs) (laughs) And there was like all these other things going on. It was actually my youngest daughter's birthday. And there was really like a lot of people that we both knew that were kind of coming to this social distancing party. And Riley was invited to play basketball, to which she was like, why would I do that? (laughs) And then other people were coming to um, around the fire where we were standing. And I could almost feel myself getting annoyed that because I just I just want to focus on this one really good, rich, deep conversation that I'm having. And so I just tell that story just to um, pull into focus for, for Riley to go play with the kids would be effort, right? And for me as the four to kind of extend and expand myself outward from just self-absorbed, you know, wanting to do that one thing that I like the most, I just thought that that example of you and I just really showed us in our numbers in that day where it took a lot, I think, Riley, you did go and play basketball at one point, but it was for like three seconds. But because it started raining, oh yeah, and the raining. second I felt a raindrop on my forehead, I was like, yes, I'm I out. can go inside. Right. <laughs> yeah, so for her to <laughs> want to play basketball, um, I'm just going to assume that there would probably have to be some support and some people there that, you know, really made you want to go play that game. But to just go and step into that seven energy, because that, to me, looked like seven energy. <laughs> that our two seven people that we know really well, uh-huh. Thomas and Will, mm-hmm. were all over that. Yep. And for you and I, you know, that, that was a bit of a stretch for both of us to have to step outside our comfort zones to go and to meet that. I think another thing to mention is uh, because I have this need to be right, if someone else tells me to go do something, my mom was like, hey, go play basketball. And I was like, I don't want to. No, yeah. I don't want to do that right now. Um, I have to decide I want to do something or it becomes like a chore, becomes a burden. And I've also struggled with that my whole life. Um, It has to be my decision. You mentioned before we went on to the mics, and I don't know if I made a note of it, but it's it's probably a good thing to talk about, is your relationship with authority? Because you talked about Mm -hmm. that earlier. Mm -hmm. 
And that, that, that to me sounds like if someone suggests something else, what, what does that look like for you? Because um, you said you had it with teachers too and profs? Teachers, bosses, professors. Um, I like respecting authority because that's where the rules come from. And I like to make sure that I'm impressing them. Yeah. But the big thing for me about authority is I only really give them the respect I should be giving authority if I think they deserve it based on my righteousness and my values. It. Yeah. S- yes, they have to earn my respect and um teachers in the past um i think teachers and professors are a problem because they're supposed to be the expert and i'm supposed to be learning and listening to them and adopting all of the things they're saying if they say something that i don't agree with that i know is wrong in in my values all of my respect for them is like seriously out the door and I become a nightmare because you don't deserve any of my respect. And even though you're supposed to be an authority, for, I get this sass and you probably can see it in my body language right now. They make me mad. And I go, you don't deserve to tell me anything mm-hmm. because you're not a good person by my standards. I don't respect you and you won't, d- I won't be nice to you. And I don't like that about myself either because, again, it's that benefit of the doubt thing that I struggle with. But, yeah, I struggle with authority that is sort of, um, they're not righteous. They're not doing the right thing. They're they're corrupted to me, almost. And I- if I can help you bring just a little bit of a, of a softer lens to that, because you said you don't like that in yourself, but all, all the numbers that live in the anger triad, the eight, nines, and ones, are managing anger in some way. And because they're managing anger in some way, they have a really, um, a lot of their attention is drawn to justice. A lot, see, like, Uh (laughs) and so I think if you were to take that energy that she just described, like, imagine her being a a high school student and going up against a professor, like that, that takes some balls, right? That takes a little bit of grit to do that. Mm And so imagine if you were to flip that over and turn it into something that's positive. Imagine Riley being an advocate for children. Imagine her being um, maybe uh, in a situation where she was helping to protect people being taken advantage of. Or if there was an adult in in someone, it doesn't have to be kids, but any vulnerable sector. Um, my, My mom has often experienced issues with, um, she sort of was in a situation where she couldn't lash out at work or not lash out, but um, whenever mom would talk to me about some of the issues that was going on at um, old jobs, Mm -hmm. um, I would get irrationally angry and I would be like, I'll write you a letter. On her behalf. Yeah. I'll write you a letter to the paper. I will go, I'll go like slap my hand on their desk and I will fight for you because I don't like when Mm -hmm. people are also not able to fight back and how can I help and work for you Mm -hmm. to make things better for you. And justice is something that my mom's always seen in me as well. And that's a gift of yours. You have that. Mm -hmm. Not everybody has that, right? And and to fight and to say, I've done the work here. I know the way. Here's the rules. And I'm going, and you're okay to uh, combat authority Mm -hmm. and not all numbers are. So, I'm also okay with people that don't like me. It's like... That don't like you? Yeah, like... Oh, interesting. You don't need to like me. That doesn't matter to Even me. Even when you go to four? <laughs> I mean, I'll think about it later. I'll be like, mm, that could have been something nice. But if I did the right thing and somebody well, doesn't like me for it, I'm like, fine. But I did the right thing. Mm. And you can live with being who you are. But I don't care if you don't like me ever again because I did what I thought was right, and that's more important. And especially if I can help someone else along the way, if I can rescue someone else Mm -hmm. and take the blame for them, that's super rewarding, and I'll take whatever cost it comes at. It doesn't matter to me as much. Mm. Yeah, that's fascinating, and I'm glad that you're able to articulate that, because I think that's a really important thing. If you can't find your number, you can ask yourself, what's my relationship with protection and justice? Because the eight, nine, and one, it'll all look a little different, although that sounds a bit eight-ish even, you know? Yeah. The, the one and the eight have some some chief features that are quite similar, but the driving underlying motivator is different, but the top note behavior can look the same. Um, but just this real sense of wanting to protect and to, to keep the order for all the rest of us. So thank you, Riley. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome.
I want to talk um, two things. Mm -hmm. I, I, I ended off the, the last um, episode with talking about subtypes. And just a quick little recap on what subtypes are is each Enneagram number, all nine numbers, will have three different versions of that number depending on how the instinct blends with the passion of the number, of the overall number. So for example, in the instincts we have what's called self-preservation, sexual energy, and um, social. And you, you kind of decide, you know, which one am I leading with? Which one of these instincts, these biological drives am I leading with? And then you blend it with the passion of your type. And then that equals your subtype. So do you have any sense of your subtype? Uh, yeah, my mom and I were talking about subtypes and I thought I was a self-preservation because on paper, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Stockpiling, take care of yourself and then check in on others. Um, but then reflexively, um, I'm, I'm a social one and I'll check on my people and then forget about me a little bit. Um, and my social circle is a little bit small. So mm -hmm. I sort of, I think, misdiagnosed that. I have, I can count on like my fingers how many people are super important to me and who I'll check on first. Mm -hmm. um, so you but care about the herd. Yeah. You care about the well-being of the group. Mm -hmm. You feel like you are a part of that group mm -hmm. and that you can sort of rise in your overall health and vibrancy by being a part of a collective. Mm -hmm. That's the social instinct. Mm -hmm. Do you kind of resonate with that one? Uh, yes, uh, that one makes most sense. But I also closely understand self-press. Yep. I'm very asleep to the sexual instinct. So you'll have one that you lead with and is in the driver's seat and is overdone. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like you're driving the car and it's snowing really, really hard and your eyes don't see anymore. But mm -hmm. it, you're still looking ahead and that's the one you're using to drive the car. Yep. Um, and then you have one that's kind of in the passenger seat. It's right there. You can see it. It's accessible. Sometimes even our second, um, it's called your sequence of your instincts. Sometimes the one that's in the, the second position is kind of the one that because it's so easy breezy, you, you can be there quite comfortably and it doesn't really seem like it's um, repressed or, or it's just quite comfortable for you. I think that would be my case. The self social self-prez, they sort of work in tandem. And then the sexual one, uh, sometimes called one-to-one -one bonding. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll just give a quick little recap of just really fast. So the self-preservation one is, um, it gets the title from B. Chestnut's work called Worry. The, the overall title of that subtype is called Worry. And they are the most professionist, um, perfectionistic of all the type ones. And anger in the self-pres ones is the most repressed. Okay, so that's the self-pres one. Uh, for the uh, social one, which you think maybe is you, um, this one is called rigidity or non-adaptability. <laughs> She's like, ding, 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 we found a winner. <laughs> Sometimes the title of the subtypes can just be like, oh yeah, yep, yep, that's me. So this one, um, this one has more of a sense of perfection for others. So I'm going to hold the standard so that all of you can kind of look to me and glean how I've worked so hard to find the straight line that we're all going to walk together, right? And that makes sen sense in that kind of hurting social kind of a way. Um, and then the third one, the sexual one, this one is called zeal. And they are the counter type to the type. Remember, there's going to be one that's upside down and goes against the energy of anger in this case. And this one has more of um, a need to protect others and reform others, but they don't really care about the perfection in themselves. They're, they could kind of, like their standards for themselves could actually be quite low, but they uh, have external standards for others and they care a lot about protecting groups and protecting people. I didn't know all that. I learned yeah. a thing or two. So those are the, the subtypes, and I want to just highlight them as we go along so that we can kind of, you know, um, kind of put them in here so that we can highlight what they are and that people can kind of go, oh, yeah, that's me. Because in, in one, the sort of perfectionistic view of the type one, uh, I didn't always identify with that. And my mom will always be like, if you're such a one, why isn't your room clean? I'll be like, mm -hmm. uh, my papers and my homework and my mm -hmm. life is pristine. But I always say there are two places in my life that are allowed to be messy, my room and my car, mm -hmm. because those are sort of my intermittent places where like after I've been busy being a one all day, you're be like, deliberate oh my gosh. <laughs> It's such a deliberate thing. It's like, I've allowed this. <laughs> yeah. Tolerance here only. Mm -hmm. So my yeah. room and my car sometimes get away from me because it's one of the only places that I think don't, it's my space and I get to live with it if they're messy. 
and I it's the only place that I don't have to keep straight. And she does a really good job of explaining that she doesn't really identify with being a perfectionist. And sometimes the Enneagram, if it does kind of get a bad rap out there, it's because it, it c- it's been presented in a way that's limiting. It mm-hmm. makes us think, well, if I'm a one, I must be a perfectionist. Well, she just, you know, so beautifully said, she doesn't really relate to that. But then again, as I, much. I also, I don't think I'm a perfectionist, but um, over by quarantine, <laughs> by in quarantine, I got really into houseplants. Mm-hmm. And I have like four or five pages in my bullet journal purely devoted to how much mist, sunlight, and water my plants need. And I have their scientific name and their common name and the name I gave them. My brother's like, you're nuts. <laughs> We would never do that. <laughs> so I, I also sometimes, uh, I think perfectionism is like, okay, and ready. I have that more mm-hmm. as a four going to one. I'm like, oh, the teapot should be on this angle. And I'm more about presentation. Yeah. And yeah. I don't identify with that, but my life is regimented and in yeah. order and someone, no one messes with my agenda or I freak There's out. There's heads to roll. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I've got my life is in order, and I think almost more than perfectionism, it's order, and everything mm-hmm. is as it should be, how I think it works best, and even my like morning routine and my schoolwork and how I organize myself is more where my perfectionism comes out, but yeah, my room isn't clean right now. And if you were to pull <laughs> some of the energy of seven, say, into your routine, do, do you kind of have like little drops of joy? in them like is there enthusiasm Mm -hmm. in that for you i put like a little dinosaur in my cycad plant because it's a jurassic era plant and i'm like "Mm, there's a dinosaur in there or that's how your seven can kind of come into the structured part exactly yeah Yeah. um like and my mom does this all the time and she'll be like look i bought a unicorn tea mug and it's like next to all her other unicorn tea mugs whereas like i've got my favorite one mug that brings me so much joy it has a little bee on it and i use Mm -hmm. it every day and it's just that one little bit um, of my day and it fits in my order but it is my little bit of joy mm-hmm. so that makes sense yeah that's awesome okay Riley I want you to give uh, we're going to wrap up here with one last question mm-hmm. and in terms of um, how to relate with you so let's say um, you and I are imagine that I was also in pale- paleontology and we were working on a project together mm-hmm. Um, how, what would be the best way for me to relate to you? Not so that you so much get your needs met, but s- more that we can just have this, n- you used the word fluid earlier, that we can have this nice fluid interaction and we can flow and I can be me and you can be you and we can together have this outcome of this project completion. What is kind of the best way to approach you in general? Um, sometimes I like when other people lay out their expectations first so that I don't violate them, um, so that I know who I'm working with Mm. and I can understand who you are. Uh, and I met my best friend by working on a project with her. So I'm sort of reflecting back to this and I liked to know who she was, um, what her expectations are before I sort of had my input so I can work with them. Um, and I like to have a really clear plan of what to do next, when this is due, when we're going to have this component done. If we need to meet up and talk about the project, are you pretty free these next couple of weeks or are you going on a trip or something? Like I like to know what's on the table and then I like to give jobs. I like to know what my responsibilities are. I like to know what you're taking care of. Um, and then I like to check in with you and in a project setting, if you don't uphold your end of the bargain, I'm going to be mad and I'm going to, I'm not going to feel sympathy for you. Is that the same as in the workplace for you? Yes. Yep. So, so if I'm slacking over here and we have the same job and we're getting the same pay. Oh, that drives me here nuts. Here comes the justice Oh piece. my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, at, at a new job, uh, I like to get to know my environment first yeah. and who am I working with? And what are my boss's expectations? And at my old job, I'd had three bosses, like new bosses, in three months. Do so you read the employee handbooks? Um, sometimes. Wow. Sometimes. That's who those things are made for. The ones. They probably well, wrote them, actually. Yeah, probably. <laughs> um, I do like to read them because sometimes there's like fun little tidbits in there like, ooh, vacation pay. And this is mm-hmm. how that works. Which is like, I know all the things that mm-hmm. sometimes the people who don't read it don't know. Um, but no, I do like to get to know my environment and the parameters of said environment first. B- 
before I sort of insert myself in a very strong mm-hmm. way um, and like the regimented way of the ones. Um, but then, yeah, you better uphold your end of the bargain because I'll hold you to it because I know what my jobs were and I'll do them really well. And you better do the same or I'm going to be mad at you. <laughs> and I think she, um, she says that so very well. And I think that's a nice place to end in just, I think, thanking ones everywhere for upholding things, for protecting us, for showing us the way when we're too emotional, too lazy, too whatever. Um, so, yeah, just a big shout out to all the ones out there that um, do such a great job of keeping the rest of us in line. And there's an important quality to that. All of the energies of all nine numbers are in all of us. Um, but they're all needed to kind of keep the, the harmonious balance of life going. So thank you, Riley. Any final words? Uh, no, I don't have anything more to say. Thanks so much for having me. I had a blast. This was awesome. So we probably won't be playing basketball anytime Mm-mm. soon together, but we probably will be seen having tea, yeah, having, having tea. long chats. And yeah. Yeah. When this is all over. When this is all <laughs> over. So wishing you all the best in your studies Thank whenever you. you get to go back and keep us updated on your journey of becoming a paleontologist. Thank you. I will. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Riley. Thanks, Jody.